So the scheduled topic is why it is, why it is good that life is a struggle. I'd be happy to talk about that, but at some request of some, wanted me to talk about um, memory. the memory, tips for memory and listening and so on. So it's your call. I could do either. Half, 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 I mean, half, 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 half. I deal with struggles well, yeah, more than I deal with memory. But. Two, both. Oh, the, the, no, at, at, at four o'clock, there's another one called Love is Not Judgment. And then, I think that's it before Shabbos. Mm-hmm. Then there'll be more later. How to find balance in life. That's really tonight. Okay. So you, so, so, so you, you want both. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. Let's start with struggle. No, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> we struggle with memory. We struggle with yeah. memory. That's the Just a, a distant memory of struggle. Just two, two Jews, three opinions. So. <laughs> okay, you know what I'll do? I'm not going to ask next time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just do what I want to do. I accept everything you say. Please do. That. That's the, 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 down, the, down, the, the, this is the downside of democracy. I to record you. Sure. Bye, home. Oh, bye, many people. Okay. Good. There we go. It's recording? Okay. Good. So I'll begin with the, the memory and I'll then work to the struggle. Because the truth is, you could combine them because, as you'll see, what I'm going to speak about really. Rabbi, we don't want to remember our struggles. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's fine, that's fine. Because as you see, what I'm going to speak about is something that I think can be a tool for dealing with anything, actually, including struggles. So let me begin with what I did, and then I'll... Uh, I'll, I'll explore it more in detail. <coughs> so when it came on a Shabbos or a holiday, so no recordings were made when the Rebbe, Lubavitch Rebbe would speak. And no notes were taken because of Shabbos. Now this was his main way of communicating. And most of his talks were delivered on Shabbos and Yom Tov and holidays. So the question is how do we have, how do we know what he said? The answer is that it was memorized by individuals who then, after Shabbos and Amtif, would go and uh, document it and annotate it and prepare it and then finally publish it. So I was one of those, and I ended up being not only the, one of the memorized, but also the main writer. So the people who remembered and there were people who wrote, but some of us could do both. Now, truth, for historical reason, for historical record, the fact is, our ancestors all did this once. Because the whole Torah Shabbat Peh, what does that mean? Oral Torah. Why is it oral? Because the Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, taught the Torah. There was only the short notes were, the written Torah was just short abbreviated points. Most of it was explained Baal Peh, orally. And the people memorized it. So everybody here has memory genes that are maybe long dormant, like fossilized, but they can be brought back to life, as I shall explain. So this was part of our history, and there was a reason for being memorized, because that's way, that way it was internalized. I don't know if you know this, but Socrates said that when they first had the first tablets, not the, not the iPad tablets, the actual tablets, when they began to carve and etch into tablets notes, he said that's the downfall of civilization. Because people won't use their minds anymore, they're going to rely on tablets. They said the same thing when uh, then, uh, then the printing press was discovered in the 15th century. Who was it? Um, Gutenberg. Gutenberg's printing press. And Amazon, Jeff Bezos, when the Kindle came out, and people said that's the downfall of civilization, he quoted the, pr- the printing press and Socrates and said every time there's a new technology, they say it's the downfall of civilization. 
Because basically technology is anything invented after you were born. That's what it is. So in that sense, memories was a very big part of education back then, but especially by the Jews. And it's really a lost art. And I want to talk about that, how we did it. But to, before I even discuss how we did it, I want to speak about the extent what had to be done. And this isn't to toot my horn, just to give you a scope of what the challenge was. So the Rebbe would speak, let's say, he started at 1.30 Shabbos afternoon, speak three, four hours, with breaks, with songs. So let's say a total of, let's say, three, four hours of speaking. The pace of the Rebbe speaking was that when he spoke in the weekdays and it was recorded and transcribed, for every hour of speaking yielded 28 nev by 11 double space pages. So four pa- hours would have to be 80 pages. That's how we knew what, how well we were doing. Because on Shabbos, if it was four hours of speaking, 80 pages had to be the final product. We were as good as able to produce <coughs> 78 out of 80 pages without redundancies. So it was pretty good, you would say. So it's not just nice memory that we remember the general ideas. It was actually 78 pages. Now there were Fabrengans that were twice that long. So it was a back down to 150 pages. And then there were times when Simchas Torah was on a Friday. So there was a Fabrengan on Thursday night before the dancing of our coffers. Friday evening, Shabbos afternoon, 1.30, and Shabbos late afternoon, which sometimes was over 16 hours of speaking. So you make them do the math. Talking about hundreds of pages, and this is all between the l'chaims and the dancing of Simchus Torah, which aren't exactly conducive for memory. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very hard, very, I, I can never describe how difficult the exertion, both the concentration and memorizing, and even more difficult the writing it down. Because one thing, memory, when you have to write it down, as the reality check that you really... I'll give you the best test. See if you can write down an hour of my speaking and see how, how, many, how many words you'll be able to deliver. You ever speak some, to hear someone speak, and you hear something really interesting... And you like really feel wow, and you're gonna sh- you feel c- uh, excited to share with people, friends. And the next day you say to somebody, the office or a friend, you say, "I last yesterday I heard something really great." Go ahead, go ahead, and you start. You, you lost for you lost for words. So what happened exactly? Were you insane? You didn't hear it. <laughs> you didn't retain it. You heard it, and it had that initial impact. It's like a lightning bolt. But it didn't, you don't own the lightning bolt after, the, after it uh, strikes. So I'm going to talk about how do you retain. That's the challenge. <clears throat> so this, well, some of this that you're going to hear now, you probably never heard before. Because nobody does this. Tell me anyone on earth that has Shabbos and holidays. And have someone that's important enough to remember what they said. We have a lot of Shabbos and holidays, but not necessarily want to remember what our... <coughs> most people fall asleep during their rabbi sermon, and they're definitely not interested in remembering it. Um, so, so, so it's very rare for anyone to do this in the modern age of technology. And, but it taught me tremendous lessons about the brain, the mind, that you rarely see unless you challenge it. And I had to challenge it. So the question is, how do you do this? How do you do such a thing? Most people, it seems impossible. And this uh, is, is, it, it appears to be something like almost, like almost a uh, photographic memory, like, you know, you hear autistic savants, you throw down, let's say, 3,000 uh, paper clips or toothpicks, and they can tell you exactly how many there are. Or people look at a f- telephone book, one glance, and they can tell you all the, num- all the names and numbers. No, I, don't, I cannot do that. That's a different type of brain. I think that's usually probably an abnormal brain. And that's why these people are abnormal. Now, I'm not saying I'm not abnormal, but I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not of that quality. Different sort. Okay. So the question is, how is this possible? How do you do such a thing? And more importantly, I will show you that you can, 
improve your memories by 20%. Money back guarantee. <laughs> and I've tried this in many workshops. And it's quite fascinating, it really is fascinating. So there's, obviously there's a lot to say. It's not just a, a quick trick. There's no quick trick here. It's not like, okay, you know, magic trick. Also, clearly you have to have a gift that even if people know and can be trained, obviously some of us are going to be better than others. But, but there is much that we can be done because as we all know, we don't even know how much percentage of our brain we use. You know why we don't know? Because we don't know how much our brain contains. How could you make a percentage if you don't know how much it is? On this table, you could say I'm using 5% of the table because you know the rest of the table. But if you don't know how large the table is, you can't say it's 5%. Maybe it's only 1% or 2%. So the capacity of the brain is a big factor here. And the only way you can really know it is by pushing the brain to its limits, which is part of what has to be done here. So let's begin with the first most important thing. Everybody thinks the art of memory is brain power. You know, a good brain. So some good brains can process well, some analyze well, some can uh, abstract well. And, um, and some memorize well. It's not the case. As you're going to see, the key to memory is not brain power. The key to memory is actually more the capacity to listen. It's the art of listening, to know how to listen. So I used to ask a question, which I won't ask any longer, because it, it was a trick question. I would ask people in a room like this, how many of you think you're good listeners? Don't raise your hands, please. Because it's a trick question. It was really meant to be embarrass the people who would raise their hands. Because no good listener would ever raise their hand. You know why? Because you never ask a person if you're a good listener. You have to ask other people if that person's a good listener. How do you know if you're a good listener? I would know if, if you're listening to me, then I could say you're a good listener. So you can't pass a verdict on yourself. Anyone that says they're a good listener, trust me, ask their spouses. And, and they will say... <laughs> or ask others. And secondly, if you're listening, as you'll see, is really an act of uh, humility. So the question is, what is the art of listening? And this is tremendous insight into how your brain works. So the brain has like two wheels in it, not physically. One we'll call the absorber, and one is called the processor. One absorbs information, and one processes information. It's very different. For example, when you type into a calculator, you want to know how much is, is the two times two, or how much is two million times three, 34,000. What happens? You, da you enter data. That's the, 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 and, the, and then the calculator or the computer processes the data. So you first have to enter the data. The machine has to then absorb it. If it doesn't get the right numbers, it won't give you good results, accurate results. And then it processes. We do exactly the same thing. We acquire information and data, and then we process information. The thing is, that memory is a direct result of this formula, this ratio. The more you process while you're absorbing, the less you remember. Memory is the more that is absorbed and less processed. That's the key to the whole thing. But how do you explain that? So I'll explain it. If you think of a segment of the population, who remembers things best? Anybody can guess? Who's the children. Children remember things best. Think of the, the stories, songs, even nonsense, oh. habits. Everything we form and everything we pick up as children remains with us forever. You can remember something. As adults, things, you know, you have, to all kinds of, have all kinds of gimmicks to try to retain something. Now, if intellect, if memory is a faculty of the intellect, children have definitely less developed intellect than adults. So how does it they remember better? Because children don't think with their egos. A child, it may be hard to get a child's attention, but when you get the attention of a child, it absorbs exactly like a dry sponge. Nothing absorbs like a dry sponge. That's why I try to teach ABC, olive bays, to adults. 
It's almost impossible. You're going to sit as a 20, 30, 40 year old and keep writing A, 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 B, 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 B. You don't have patience for it. You're busy trying to figure out how to make money or trying to do something. Why are you interested in repeating? But children have that natural, so to speak, uh, receptivity and impressionability like dry sponges, and they absorb. And they don't process because they don't have tools to process yet. Their minds aren't developed, and they don't have an outlook yet on life. So they have no experiences by which to use as a context to process, process, process information. Adults, exact opposite. Our sponges are wet, are saturated. What is a saturated sponge? Can it absorb information? It could, but it's going to be more difficult because it's already wet. So what we do is mostly process because we know how to process because we already have an outlook, a perspective on things. So when I'm speaking right now, what adults do, what we all adults do is, oh, I like this speaker, I don't like this speaker. Um, I can make money with this, I can't make money with this, you know. We're processing as we're listening. And especially if we're smarter, the smarter you are, the more you process, because you have your outlook on things, and now you're fitting in what you're hearing into your outlook, which is already defined. Your sponge is already wet, and you're fitting new information into that sponge. So we're processing and not really absorbing. That's why most people cannot remember well. And uh, when the Rebbe spoke, the first thing we had to do was shut off the processor. Just absorb. And this may sound completely weird to you, but it's absolutely true. The more I understood the Rebbe, the less I remembered it. The things, the ideas he spoke about that I already had a perspective on, I would remember less than the things I did not. Because something new, it was like I was a dry sponge. I was hearing it for the first time. Clean slate. If it was something I knew already, the concern was always, and maybe I'm fitting it into my way of understanding it. And what's the first thing a, a regular person does, especially an intelligent person? You hear an idea, you right away say, ah, that answers a question I had yesterday. That fits into this. You right away put it onto your shelves, and you're already fitting it into your structure, which means you're not absorbing, you're processing on your terms. So you're not hearing and listening to what the speaker is saying. You're really fitting the ideas into what, you, what works for you. And that's a very different type of experience. Now, I'm not arguing that one should not process, but process comes after absorbing, listening. I'll just give you two examples. If you're standing in front of a judge and a jury, and uh, there's a case, and there's a persuasive piece of evidence, or a persuasive uh, witness, right? So very many of us, if we're sitting there will be influenced but you don't want the judge and the jury if you're honest to come to any conclusion because of one piece of evidence you want them to wait and hear them all you can't process till you first hear everything but it's very easy to do to begin processing before you finish so the same another example when you research anything you research you're writing a paper you want to research an idea so you first have to gather all the data and information before you come to conclusions. If you start writing a conclusive statement based on my research and you forgot to, and you didn't take into consideration the last piece of data, it may be a very different conclusion. So we all know these two steps. One is what we call discovery, gathering information, information gathering. And then comes processing that information and saying, okay, what conclusions do we come to? So most adults don't know how to do that when it comes to situations, regular situations, because we don't have the patience, we already think we've got to figure it out, or whatever other reasons. That's why it was, it's so difficult to really remember well, because we do not know how to absorb without processing. And that was a constant effort, and it was not easy. So when the Rebbe would speak, for example, let's say an hour. After he finished speaking, they would sing a song, I had to go over and I'd review the whole thing in my mind from beginning to end. Not rely that I figured it out already and I'd uh, be overconfident. Actually, literally go over each point and point and just what was said without trying to understand what was said. Understanding would come later. Processing would come later. And we'd do that after every talk and have that impression in my mind. I'll get back to that a little later. But some other points I want to make. But I'm going to show you this now in a concept of an exercise that every one of you can do in the privacy of your own 
um, environment, and it's guaranteed to, as I said, make your memory grow. And the exercise goes like this. I've tested this with over a thousand people in smaller groups. You can't do it in a large group. And the exercise goes, you take any book you like, or any safer, any, anything a book, the goal is to read a page or two of your choice, and you can read it as many times as you like without any time limitations. Then close the book and write on a piece of paper the ideas, not word for word, the ideas you just read. <clears throat> and before I start the exercise, I always ask the group, ask yourself, what do you estimate would be the percentage of the amount that you're going to capture by memory on paper? Most people say between 60 and 80%. I can tell you that rarely have I met a person that was able on the first try to hit over 60. And this is what happens. So then we start, everybody takes their book, they start. The smart ones you see do it very fast, and they already write something down. Um, by 15 minutes, 20 minutes, everybody's done. And then I asked everybody to take the book and what you wrote to give it to your neighbor, and let's now evaluate. And uh, they evaluate, and you find exactly that people, you know, some capture a little more, some less. But here's, this, here's the interesting thing. The people who did it the fastest, meaning the smartest ones, are the ones that get the lowest percentage. To the extent, and I kid you not, there were individuals that actually wrote on paper something that contradicted what it said in the book. And when I asked them, how could you write something that contradicts in the book? They said, because I didn't agree with it. <laughs> You'll all understand exactly. Huh? You understand exactly the story. What's the story? That the guy didn't even listen to what I said. I said, but that's not the exercise whether you agree or not. The exercise was the, is to write what it says there. And even that you couldn't do. Okay, so then I give everybody a second chance. We go do a second time. And everybody gets 20% better results. That's the guarantee. Why? Because firstly, they were all humbled. After they saw the results, they realized that they were overconfident. Everybody thinks they're smarter than they are. Everybody thinks they remember better than they are. They, everybody thinks they're better listeners than they are. And the first thing you need to know is you're not. That humbling is, allows you to go the second time around, so everybody looks at the book, it takes at least a half hour, nobody takes it for granted, they read it again and again and again and again. And I saw, I see, they read it and they, before they, but they, have, they can't write till they close it, and they read it till they really absorb it. So they didn't realize how much effort you need to absorb. They think, okay, you know what, I read it, I got it. Right, you know, that's, that's it. And the second time around, I'm telling you, it goes up from 60 to 80%. The mm-hmm. people that, that got 70, that got a little lower, a little higher. And it shows you how, how different it is to absorb and to process. So that's the first thing. The same th- exercise you can use in many different ways in communication. Because what I'm saying now is really a tool, not just in remembering, It's also communication. Someone you care about, you have a disagreement. Do you know how to disagree in in a proper way? Look at this country today, polarized. Everything is personal. They don't even know how to disagree like normal human beings. I have have brothers and sisters. I may not agree with them, but I love them, and I never invalidate them because I disagree with them. Why do we personalize? Why do you have to be wrong for me to be right? Because I'm not really secure that I'm right. You know? So here's the thing. So in a disagreement, let's deal with that, a disagreement. Two people have a disagreement, legitimate disagreement, and both are legitimate points they make. How do you deal with it? So usually, it, often it turns into pettiness and personalizing and anger. And you know what? You just, uh, get, you just get disgusted with each other, and it can break down. But what's an intelligent way of disagreeing? Why don't I try to understand your position Without processing, let me just absorb what you're saying. Why can't you give me the respect to just listen? Repeat to me what I just said. Very few people can repeat something they disagree with. Why? Because they are processing, their ego is in the way. They've already come to conclude, but maybe there is some truth to the other person. Is it always 100% you're right and the other person is 100% wrong? I rarely will find a case like that. Even when there's, one is right and wrong, there's no such thing as 100% and zero. Again, I'm not talking about someone that's completely... You know, ill or, or something problematic. 
And generally speaking, two intelligent people to say, I know myself from any, anyone who runs a business knows, you know, you brainstorm about an idea, someone comes up with an idea, someone challenges the idea, and that's how the idea becomes a richer idea because it's challenged, and then you come back with a, a counter argument and a counter, counter argument. That's how you crystallize an idea. I know for myself, many times I come up with an idea, and I right away say to myself, one second, maybe we should do the exact opposite. Because that way you really challenge to see whether that, you don't just invest in the first idea that came your way. You want, you want to have the best of, the, of all worlds. So here's a second type of exercise. You have a disagreement with your spouse, let's say. You know, maybe it's a long-standing disagreement that you decided, you know what, we'll just agree to disagree. We won't talk about it because it just aggravates everybody. But maybe this is not a good idea, but, but maybe it is. You go back to your spouse and say, okay, I know we disagree about this. I want to go vi- revisit it. I want to repeat to you your position as best as I can. And tell me if I'm conveying accurately what you think. And it's not what I agree with, but I want to see. I know it, 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 you smiled correctly. You know why? Because it's very, very, it's almost impossible to do that. If you can do that already, you're going to have shalom bias. Because it means that you can repeat to your spouse, to your wife, or to your husband something that you totally disagree with, and they say yes, you, you, you presented it correctly, you're already in a good shape. Because it means you can understand the other person. But we, most of us would not do that. What we would do is we repeat it, but we repeat it with some type of little edge to show how we can really, that really has no, you know, it's like you repeat it in a way that you can immediately uh, uh, re, re, refute it. So, so the Talmud says about Hillel and Shammai, they had a disagreement. <clears throat> So what Talmud says at the end, finally, and both of them had legitimate arguments. As a matter of fact, Elu ve'elu, both are considered divine opinions. But then finally there came a time when it was resolved that the consent, that would be Hillel. What Hillel said would be the final say. But you know the reason given for this? You'd think because Hillel was more brilliant, because he made better arguments, because he was more uh, true to the source. No. It's because Hillel was humbler, because when he presented an argument, he first presented Shammai's argument before his own in a completely legitimate way, and then he presented his own. Most people don't do that. What do we do? You present your argument, then you say, and they say, one second, did everyone agree? You say, no, there were a few people who had a different little position. You give a little three minutes and say something to be Yetza, and then you go, and you say, yeah, but there was opinions, but it wasn't like my opinion. That's usually, I mean, you don't necessarily say it in those words, but that's what you imply. Hillel did the opposite. He presented Shammai's argument to the point that Shammai was satisfied with how he presented it. Can you imagine? A person disagreeing with you presents your argument as good as you would, and then Hillel would present his. So the Talmud says because he had that humility, then it means you can trust his objectivity. Shammai was also objective, but he didn't have it to that extent. That means you really have a person who has integrity. He's not looking to be right. He's looking for the truth. And that's a big difference. Many people's arguments is, I want to be right. So in Hasidic thought, they say the difference between Chachma and Bina. They say Chachma is the idea takes the person. And Bina, the person takes the idea. It's very different. One is, the, the idea is true. And the other one says, I understand the idea. You see the difference? The first one's not about I. It's what is the truth. It doesn't matter about what I think. And the second one says, I understand. I understand the idea. I grasp the idea. And the first one, the idea grasps you. You'll see anyone really taken by truth. You see the truth absorbs you. You don't absorb the truth. And that was the ultimate. When we were able to do that, we were able to remember in the best possible way. So that's one key thing. So you could see how this is so fundamental in everything. Do you really listen to somebody that, that if you hear them say something you don't like? Do you listen to your children with that type of attention? Do you listen to your spouse with that type of attention? Unfortunately, we don't. Because, firstly, we're busy. Secondly, we think we got it already. Sometimes we think they're just childish or foolish. We may not say it. The respect of the dignity, the sacred dignity of another human being is the essence of really remembering. You never think that, right? You think memory, okay, smart person, you remember. No, no, no. Smart, the, the memory comes from respecting the sanctity and dignity of another person. In this case, it was the Rebbe. And I have to say, of course, a critical component was because what he said we found valuable. So, you know, if you hear someone speak 
and you know that you feel that it's like Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with news, with, inf- with truth that you're not going to hear again. And after Shabbos, there's no recordings. Trust me, your adrenaline will start running quickly as well, and you'll remember a lot better. If you heard that there'll be a talk delivered tonight, Friday night, and no notes, no tape recordings, and you know it could change your life, you're going to absorb a lot better than process because you know this is a life thing. So that was a critical... Like today, many times someone comes over to me, they share something with me. I may be daydreaming, and they say, so did you hear what I said? So, you know, the diplomatic way of saying when you didn't hear it, you say, can you rephrase it? You know? <laughs> Which really meant I, I fell asleep or, uh, or I was distracted, you know. I'm just giving you a trick of the trade, so don't worry. I won't, I, I won't, I, I won't use that line on anybody over this weekend. You know, if you hear someone say, rephrase it, you'll know. It means they didn't hear it the first time. Um, but often someone says something to me, and I say, you know, uh, can you repeat it? And they say, seven hours of the Rebbe's talk so you can remember. You can't remember two words of mine. Um, so I say, so I don't want to say to them because I don't hear any history unfolding in what you're saying exactly. You know, but it's part of it. And I'm not saying it's, 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 it's my fault because the truth is you have to respect every person's words. But still, when the Rebbe spoke, there was that element of uh, awe, of, of a truth that you're hearing that of caused you to want to absorb. So it doesn't come automatically. I have to turn on those wheels because it's very easy just to listen superficially. So I'm just adding that into the equation. Now, why this is so vital in life is because this in Hasidic thought is the concept of bittel. You ever hear the word bittel? Uh-huh. So bittel, like B-I-T-T-U-L. So in, uh, in English, it's very hard to translate. I don't know if in Russian you can translate it either. But in English, you know, how do you translate bitl? It's a combination of humility, modesty. The word I like to use most is like suspension of yourself to absorb something greater than yourself. Nullification. Nullification. But that's why I don't use nullification, because it sounds like annihilation. Right. Nullification sounds like annihilation, like destruction. So it is in form of nullification, a positive form. But it's all the above. It's really suspending you in order to absorb. It's like becoming a dry sponge, or what we call a clay le kabbalah, a container to receive something more than yourself. It's a fundamental concept in kabbalah chassidus, to be a keli, which means are you absorbing a higher presence? That is the key. Now, we don't live in a world that we're trained to do that. Everyone's teaching you to be, you're the big person. What do you mean? Why should you absorb something or someone else? But that's why this is so vital, because really memory is a result of listening, and listening is a result of absorbing of something greater than you are. That's how you become a greater person. When you learn Torah, you learn something that's sacred. You're not just sitting there, okay, we're equals. You tell me what you think, and I'll tell you what I think. No, no, no. You're sitting in a, like a student before a teacher, absorbing a higher truth. And you ask anyone even in the music business, even athletes in sports, they talk about being in the zone. You ever hear? In the zone. What's in the zone? In the zone is where there's a melting of the subject and the object that you don't even feel yourself anymore. You're so connected with what you're doing that you're just like a channel that's going through you. I don't know if any of you are writers or if you're musicians. There's a point where you're in the zone and athletes talk about it as well. After a lot of training, you come to a point when, when, the, when the pressure is built you just almost like disappear as a, as a self-conscious individual and something just flows through you. Your, your skills take over. Now that comes with a lot of training. It doesn't happen overnight. and doesn't always happen at will. Sometimes you lose it. It's like when you ever, you ever read a book, you get so absorbed in the book, you don't even know you're turning pages. Not only that, you don't even know you're reading a book. You could sweat, you can cry, you can laugh, you can get suspense, you know, page turner. You don't even realize you're paid. And someone says to you, what are you crying? You're just looking at a book. And then you realize that there's, there's something going on here. Because the writer is so good, he's gotten you so engaged that you're absorbed. Like, same thing with music. You put on a headset, mesmerized by music, and you transport it to another time and place. I'm sure all of you have experienced this. It's a tremendous experience. And when you come out of it, you always say, I wish I could re- re- recreate that. It's not always easy to. Because we are live in a du- world of duality. There's the you, and there's your experience. But feeling like a fish in water. You think fish feel they're in water? No, that's what a fish in water is like. A, it's just seamless. 
Like someone, someone say to you a question, what does it feel like to be healthy? Tell me. What does it feel like to breathe? If you tell me what it feels like, you probably need a doctor. Because health doesn't feel like anything. If you feel that you're breathing or you feel your heart is thumping, that means something is out of sync. Health is an invisible feeling. Like if I'll say to you right now, what is your left leg doing? Before I said it, you didn't even know. Didn't mean the left leg didn't exist. It's just you weren't conscious of it. Consciousness does not necessarily mean reality. It just means you're experiencing it. As a matter of fact, one could argue that when you're not conscious, you're more in touch than when you are conscious. Because conscious means, like, okay, put my hand in water, it gets wet. But a fish doesn't get wet, just like water doesn't get wet. Water is wetness. Because you're one with experience. Are you following what I'm saying? So this is ultimately when you're really in absorbing mode. In a way, love is like that. When people are in a healthy, sacred, intimate relationship, there's a point where they melt into each other and there's no consciousness. And as soon as you're conscious, you lose the magic. This is a very common thing in many real experiences. A real experience is always going to be that the individual and the ego gets dissolved in the experience. And that is the ultimate of absorbing. And that's why it's so... Uh, fundamental, that's true bittel. That's true bittel. You know, some of us are going to go to the mikvah before Shabbos. What do you think a mikvah is? It's total immersion that you completely submerge yourself like a fish in water. And there's no self anymore. That's why in Hebrew, the word tefillah, which means to immersion, is the same letters as habitel. Because it's total sublimation. Total sublimation in another reality, in this case, water. We say when Mashiach comes, the world will be filled with divine knowledge as what? As the waters cover the sea. You always see this analogy again and again. Waters cover the sea. It's like you're inside the water, you feel completely engulfed. In a way, the first nine months of our lives, we were completely submerged in the embryonic fluids of our mother. The, Talmud, the Torah tells us that the universe was created, it was all covered in water. Because we all began in a non-dual non-duality existence, a, u- a unity, a, a fundamental oneness. And then there became the two, the you and the experience. So this is a little deeper analysis of what means absorption. And then processing is already you processing the ideas, which comes as the next stage. So that's one, one point. I'll make one more point on this, and then um, maybe you'll have some questions. Another point is that in, in remembering well, you have to, uh, besides getting your ego aside, and you're, it's not about you understanding, it's about absorbing what is being said, there's also an element of uh, fact knowing that memory begins to fade imme- immediately. It doesn't fade tomorrow, it doesn't fade in a week from now, it fades as soon as you hear it. So the key thing is to constantly make copies of that which you heard. Think of it like you're going to remember what you remember you remembered, not what you actually heard in the first place. And the more you do that, the more you remember what you remember, you remember, you remember, you remember. It's like making a bunch of photocopies. So the Rebbe spoke, let's say, one thirty, and reviewed it. The more I reviewed it through the Shabbos, till the end of Shabbos, the better it was retained. Because in a sense, you constantly rem- you'll always remember the last copy you made. So that was another vital thing, repetition. And finally, I want to say is, there's another element which is the element of uh, making a mental map. When, let's say, someone's driving you somewhere, first time, and uh, you want to remember the directions, and you don't have ways or GPSs and so. So what do you do? You you look. You say, okay, we went straight on the highway, and then I made a right, and a left, and then two rights, and one more left. You make these mental, uh, 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 make signposts, mental signposts. So the same thing when the Rebbe would speak. So some ideas flowed very smoothly. Let's say he's speaking about the Shabbos or something. He's talking about the ideas. But then he would go on a tangent or go into another detail. So you have to memorize, like make a little signpost that at this point, the, Rebbe went, the next idea went to the right. And then he came back. I, what I would do for myself, one of my tricks, what I did was I would actually number all these signposts. So at the end of a talk, I would say there were 52 points in this talk. And I knew that if I don't remember all 52, it means I'm missing something. So sometimes I'd go over it and I'd remember, let's say, and I'd see between 30 and 32, I missed something. But I knew I missed it. Then I could ask someone else, maybe they heard it. 
or later would come back to you later. So it was like a mental roadmap that was almost like 52 signposts. That's just a number I'm throwing out. That would be the 52 key points made in this uh, talk. But you can imagine the exertion and the concentration needed to do this. No room for uh, error and no room for distractions. Because if you, you distract yourself one second, you lose the whole side. It would be like, okay, you know the right way. So if they took a right, you forgot that there was a right take. These are just some of the key things. As I said, I would hope to like to write a book about this. I actually have written already an outline and break it down. Because the real thing that I take out of all this that I would want to share with you is that this is a lesson not just in memory. It's a lesson, as I said, in communication, in relationships, in education. I frankly don't know if there's an area in life that this cannot help you. Because it tells you how to listen well, how to learn, how to, avoid mis- how to learn from mistakes. You don't let your ego get in the way. You're always looking for the truth and not, rather than whether you should be right. And so many other little factors here that really, as I said, I don't think there's an area, virtually an area in life that this would not impact. So I hope I, hope I did some justice to this. And my goal really is, of course, to empower you with these tools. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take some questions. But I will tell you, even though the topic was this, I will say struggle. Everything in life, when you're able to experience bittel, you're able to get beyond it. The people who've suffered greatly in, in history, in life, in our times, you'll see those that are able to get through difficulties is because they do not take the experience at face value, and they know how to grow through it. Those people that dwell and become obsessed with it ultimately become overwhelmed by it. And it's really the transcendence, and that is why Bittl is so necessary. I've seen people that suffer. My father lost his parents before he was 20 years old. He had to rebuild his whole life with two little baby brothers in America. And, you know, he didn't complain about it, but he had that resilience. And then I saw other people, they didn't. You always see the distinction. You know, Viktor Frankl said it was due to the man's search for meaning. The meaning in people's lives gave them the ability to survive. Mm-hmm. Even though they didn't suffer less, but they have an additional resource. The Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Lubavitch Rebbe, put it this way. When he was threatened with a gun to his head that said that this gun has made many people change their principles, he said this, this toy can frighten someone. This was the communists, the Jewish communists, in 1921, when they first arre- the first time they interrogated him. 1920, actually. And later he was arrested in 1927. We're just coming from Yud Beis, Yud Gimel Tammuz. So one of the stories is that they pointed a gun and they said this can change people's principles. And he said it can frighten someone, this toy, who has one world and many gods. And he added that for every taiva, for every pleasure in life, he has another god. But it cannot frighten someone that has one god and two worlds. Why? Because I have this world, I always have another world. You cannot frighten me because I have more than just one reality. It's the idea that there's more to life than your immediate pain or joy. You know, you always think about why do you break a ch- by a chuppah, you break a glass, right? By a wedding ceremony. So the common reason is because you remember your shalayim. We you have to always remember it, even with Sim Chasi, even at the greatest height of joy, you have to always remember the destruction of your shalayim. We're now in the three weeks. I remember the destruction. But why at that point? Why is, isn't that like strange? The highest point in a person's life is standing under the chuppah. You know, after that, it may go downhill, but at least that point. <laughs> you know? Look, they joke, they say, the difference was between an engagement and a battle. The engagement is when they get engaged, and the battle is after the wedding, you know? <laughs> but, God forbid, it's just a joke. I don't actually like these type of uh, marriage jokes, but I couldn't resist. <laughs> um, so you break up glass at that high point, the chuppah, the highest point. You could do break the glass at the end of the wedding, some other point. So a thought that I always thought of, I think I saw it somewhere, I don't remember where, that the beauty of it is this, this the wisdom of Jews, that even when you're at the highest point of your joy, you don't forget that there's a world that's not necessarily a joy yet. There are other people who have broken lives, who have despair, who have sadness, and you don't get arrogant even in your joy. Because anyone that's fully consumed by joy and forgets those that are more needy at that moment, then you know what happens, God forbid? Then when the day comes, God forbid, 
and this person experiences something painful, that's also complete, and there's also no room for anything else. And you'll always see this. People obsessed completely with one type of emotion will always be obsessed with the other extreme. And people who have bittal realize that even in the moment of joy, it's not just about me. There are more people to think about. And, and then when a person becomes in a sad pl- place, they are also remembered because it's not 100%. There's also this thing as 100% happy 100%. You know there's balance in everything, in moderation. So bittal is a tool that is really, affects every part of life. Those that have it can navigate. They know they're resilient. They don't know nothing can destroy you. So you don't ever, you never worship yourself. Not when you're in the happiest moment, you don't worship yourself when you're in the saddest moment. Like sometimes people say, you know, Arrogance, you think, is only when you are feeling better than everybody? No, when someone says, I'm worthless, and you say, who are you to say you're worthless? God created you. <laughs> it's also a form of arrogance. You decided you're worthless. But just like, who are you to say you're great? You, no one asked you whether you're worthless either. God wants you to be valuable, so you're valuable. So you see how this, this uh, tool, you can say, bitl, is a tremendous tool in everything in life, everything, literally. So I wish everybody to have only a healthy form of bittal, to be able to find ways to grow. In Hasidic thought, you'll find the constantly the concept, the journey, every journey goes. You're on one level, then you have to shed that layer of skin and go to the next level. It's called yesh, ayin yesh. First you're in a state of being, you shed that layer of skin and you grow to the next state of being. A, a seed needs to deteriorate before it becomes a sapling and a beautiful flower. All of us go through frustration before we come to creativity. Everything, every birth will always come, will be preceded by some form of pain. But you always realize it's a journey and it's not stop. You never, you see it through. Constant journey. And bittal is always there between one stage, one transition to the next. So we should all have only good, healthy bittals and only growth in that type of way. Yeah. I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah, Rabbi. Uh, but the Fabrengen, many things what the Rebbe was talking is about Parsha, about Siddhis, you read it more than a few hours of things. How you able to take this as a new thing? No, no, no. So the, 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 you, you had to, the Rebbe spoke, let's say, Yiddish. You had to know basics. You had to know basics. But you did not allow your Havana, your understanding of it, to get in the way. So you're like, you know, the Rebbe spoke, let's say, about Shabbos. So we know what Shabbos is, but we didn't let our previous understanding of it affect what he's going to say now. And you're like, listen, like, kol yem you're like hearing it new. Like you ever see a nigan, you can sing a song, like, like it's an old song, but then you can sing a song, the same song, if you sing it with a chayis, with a, with a vitality, you can sing it like you never sung it before. I remember many times that I've seen a song, everyone said, I heard that song already, but he sang it with a new passion. The kavon is new. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but that's what, how I would, I would approach it. Maybe I misunderstood. Um, because you said, uh, when stop, what you already think you know about this, is harder to remember, remember it. Yeah, because if the Rebbe, let's say, was speaking about, let's say, explaining a Ninian in uh, whatever, Nigla, Chassidus, or whatever. Let's say, in Sibus, uh, about you know, Yeah, and you're ready. But then you know about this. Yes, yeah, so then you're going to fit what he's saying into what you know. Right. So you had to. Put, so we didn't. We didn't do that. That's what I said. We didn't let that understanding. You just like as of a new time. That's for the first time. What is that syllabus? It's like when you learn a mime, even though you know, you have to learn what it says here, not what you know, from before. You can't let pre-existing uh, conditions affect you. Yeah. Understand, let's say, for example, uh, when he even Rebbe was talking about uh, within the science thing, that uh, a lot of science maybe you understand, math and physics, but something you don't understand, 
right? And you later write about it, you remember it, but you still don't understand it. You just write it. You can't write it. No, no, it's a good question. I hear you. I hear you. Right? How would you. Okay, no, so, so. It's a good question. It's a little touching on what he asked, but first of all, if you didn't know at all anything, if you're just ignorant, let's say a two-year-old child or five-year-old child standing by Fabring is not going to remember anything, even though he has like a dry sponge. Because you're not just remembering words, you need to know a little what they mean. The question is, do you allow your previous understanding make a difference? So let's say the Rebbe spoke about something in physics I never heard before. So I would try to remember as best as what he said, I'd write it down, then I'd show it to a physicist and say, what do you think this means? But if a physicist was standing and listening, he'd probably fit it into his preconceived notions and maybe miss what the teacher was saying. That's what I'm saying. So you need both. And, and when we processed it, we definitely uh, and analyzed it. We, we, we discussed it. I'm just saying first stage is get the ideas down. Then see how it fits into the whole scheme of things. And I sometimes would call experts in a particular subject to study it. But that was after we already wrote down what was remembered. Five more minutes questions. And then another, yeah, I know. Okay. Right. In addition to the, to the, to the putting aside the, uh, the processing, don't you find that because you had to repeat those, you remember them twice as well that if you just was for yourself. If you had the assignment to remember for yourself, you would not remember it as much as because you had to reproduce it. So like if you listen to a class to repeat it afterwards, don't you remember much, much more? Yeah, it, it forces you, to, yeah, it pushes you to remember better, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Had the Rebbe just spoken to me privately? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. What, the more pressure there is, the better it is. The pressure, yeah, the pressure to publish it and... And to focus. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So, uh, what about um, Chip Do you have any tips for... You know, it sounds really good. We hear a lot about this, but how, you know, I was trying to memorize something. So what do you do with those processing thoughts that keep popping in and... It, is it just practice over and over, go away? And, you know. I would begin with the exercise I suggested with a book uh -huh. to see how well you do. You need to see how well you don't do before you start doing better. That's the first tip. It's like someone says, what's the big thing? I'll run a marathon of 21 miles. Yeah, go try. Try to run a mile, for, try to run a, one mile. So I would suggest start with a book idea. So, and then you get humble. So, so no. no, no. So you see, how do you read a page? I teach a class every morning in my house. A Hasidic text. And with good advanced scholars. And again and again, people, as soon as we read something, they're already interpreting and explaining. And I always say, first let's finish the page. What is the author saying first? So the first thing you have to do is take a book. A book will be easier to do than do it in a recording. You could do a recording too, but I would take a book. A book with profound ideas, maybe Hasidic ideas, whatever it is, and see, are you able to just capture what it says in the book without interpretation? How well do you do? Once you see that, and you evaluate that, then you can determine, can you do the same thing now for 10 pages? And 20 pages? And you'll see yourself becoming better and better. How often, I mean, we all know when, we, when sometimes we hear a talk delivered or we're in a class, you take notes. Then you review your notes later. And you see, and you slowly, as you review them, you become better and better at retaining these ideas. So that would be a great idea. Take a concept. I said two pages, but ultimately you really want to take a full concept, read it, and put it in your own words. Write an essay. What did the author say? The truth is good schooling, that's what they tell you to do. You have to write papers and papers and papers. But write an essay. Sum up this week's Parsha in your own words, for example. I'm talking Jewish concepts. It could be non-Jewish concepts or secular concepts. But the, the, there's no way to learn how to do this without actually doing it. I can give you tips from today till tomorrow. If you, just like someone can give you tips how to swim. If you don't jump into swim, you're not going to swim. So, you, so my tips are is actually go ahead, take these books, take a book that you like, and begin. And then you'll see. Choose a book that you actually enjoy. I'm sure you've read books you like. And see, can you convey the idea of the book in your own words? You're saying not a novel, but something with... I would do it with a book, more, uh, more ideas, ideal, yeah. A novel, you couldn't do it if the novel has content. Just to talk about, uh, you know, just some, some foolish uh, plot, I don't think there's any value in going to memorize that. 
But let's say a novel that has some type of significant message. Yeah, good values. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that would be. I mean, the truth is a good book review is what I'm talking about. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. A book review. But a book review has two parts. One is saying what is the thesis of the book, and then what is your interpretation of that thesis. That's where I would make the distinction. No problem with an interpretation, but begin first with the, with the thesis. Can anybody write up a summary of what I said this last hour? Some notes. Probably not, right? Even though I think you understood it. Why? Because you have not done the absorbing part. You didn't listen. You, you, listened. you understood me understanding me. You didn't understand me, you understanding me. You understood me understanding me. You see what I'm saying? Now, you could do it, by the way. If you listened to it on recording and wrote notes. And I'm not saying you have to do it with my talk. I'm just using it as an example here. But if you want to be able to... Um, Absorb what I said here. You're gonna. Ha- There's no only other way except you. You cannot just rely that you heard a nice talk Friday afternoon, which that you may remember, but you won't remember what was said in detail. When you're counseling somebody or trying to help somebody. Yes, it's so easy to do the summary. What you said, we just remove the word wine and said it is good that life is struggle. There you go, you got it. I see you know how to find shortcuts. <laughs> now you can go to sleep. <laughs> go ahead. When, you're, when you're counseling somebody, don't you feel the need while they're telling you their problem that you have to um, be thinking, not of an answer while they're talking, but it's, unless you're brilliant, it's very difficult to let someone t- totally observe, observe yourself and then, and then when they're done, come up with something to help them? Or is listening to them really a lot of the cure to kind of let them and really under- feel they're understood? It's almost like a... Hard. So what, what's, what's your solution? In the middle of their talking, you're going to give them advice? No, but you're processing. As they're talking, half of your mind is almost like, oh, I think I can help this way and this way. I would not do that. That's what men do a lot. We're trying to like, give solutions 24-7. And, you know? and it's a big problem. Right. That's why they usually are off. So, yeah. Or they say computers are like men, right? They have a lot of data, but they're clueless. So it's almost to totally absorb yourself in their problem, and then when it's finished, you're, you're trying to... Yeah. Yeah. They say sometimes women are like computers. Why? You know Why? The computer itself is not that expensive as the accessories. <laughs> There's a big argument about the male female. <laughs> well, hold on, hold on. Good question. Let me answer. In a therapeutic setting, he's asking, does it make sense that when a person is telling you, sharing you their life, should you be processing partially to coming up with the ready suggestions? And I would advise against that completely because what happens if you miss something? Right. And you're ready... I think the way to go is, is the most important thing is empathy. Yeah. So there's value in just listening to someone's story and getting the details yeah. and simply showing empathy. But there's another thing. Once you hear the whole story, then you can say to yourself, okay, based on this, what would I advise? Why do you have to process while the they're confidence speaking? Confidence in the fact that you'll come to it. Because sometimes you get nervous. I want to be able to... I want to no, no, I got you. Back. I got you. Yeah. So sometimes you have to wait and listen because you never know. Because to be honest, most people speaking to you are not going to tell you in the first five minutes everything. Mm. It'll usually come later as they get more comfortable. Right. And you'll probably have to ask questions anyway. So I think the process, the process I would do in a therapeutics, I do this all the time, is I first let them share everything they want. Why, you know, why are you here? What share? Right. Make them comfortable and so on. You could sometimes interject with a question, but I would usually let them speak. Mm. Then I would ask some questions. May I ask you some more? What, what, you know, what did your mother do about it? What did your father do about right. it? What about your sibling? So as they get more comfortable, you're gonna hit, you're gonna get a, you want to get a profile of them. There for sure you don't want to process before that. Because you may hear something in the last two minutes that changes the whole way of looking. Maybe right. you find out something horrible that you don't even know. Right. So it would be not wise at all. And, and there's nothing wrong with asking a question and clarifying, yeah. getting more information. And as you do, you, you get a profile of the person. Then you try to then fit and say, based on what you know, I think experience won't do that. I think inexper- if you're not that experienced, yeah. you think you have to right away say something. Right. You don't have to say anything. You have to listen first. And, and if you're talking to somebody who doesn't have to share your morality, do you feel that you nullify yourself to hear their stuff? Let's say, not, yeah, yeah, you have not to. a missionary, but if, I'm saying if, like, if you're in the role of helping someone, you cannot no, no, let's allow. Let's say like it. a missionary or somebody. Yeah, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna roll out here. Anybody is going, there's another session here. If anybody has questions, I'm going to go out in the hall. I'll be happy to. Uh, I I'll be in the hall. I know anybody has questions, please follow me out into the wilderness.